Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's joint National Park Service, United States Navy, Pearl Harbor Day Remembrance Ceremony. My name is Bob Sandla, and it's truly an honor for me to serve as today's Master of Ceremonies. The theme today is preserving history, a theme particularly relevant in a world filled with news, information, and gossip available on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, leaving us little time for quiet reflection. But on this day, in this historic place, we have time to reflect on what happened here, learn from it, and pass the lessons on to future generations. December 7, 1941, must never be forgotten. The Arizona Memorial and the tower on Ford Island, which you see out there, are visible manifestations of the beginning of World War II. The USS Missouri represents the victorious end of that war. But as the survivors here among us, and the thousands of people from around the world who visit Pearl Harbor who must preserve the history of this sacred site. Thus, we are honored to have with us today USS Arizona crew members John Anderson, Don Stratton, Lou Conter, and Lauren Bruner, who somehow survived the attack that destroyed the Arizona, and of course, many, many other survivors. In Thank you. In, in times past, other events have made it vital to preserve their history. Bunker Hill, Fort McHenry, Gettysburg, the beaches and cemeteries of Normandy, Vietnam, September 11th, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the list goes on. Therefore, as a nation, we must remember and preserve, and most importantly, transmit the lessons of what happened here on a beautiful Sunday morning 73 years ago, not unlike this one today. Today, on this December 7th, we are doing just that. And on the morning of December 7th, the Japanese Naval Carrier Task Force launched a surprise air attack on airfields and naval facilities located on the island of Oahu. Their primary target, the ships of the Pacific Feet, Fleet, excuse me, located right here at Pearl Harbor. Then as now, Pearl Harbor was of vital strategic importance to the defense of our nation. Today, our servicemen and women stationed in Hawaii continue the legacy of honor, courage, and commitment of those who served before and who witnessed that terrible morning on December 7th. At the end of the attack, 21 vessels were either sunk or severely damaged. 323 Army and U.S. Navy planes had been damaged or destroyed, and 2,390 Americans were killed. This morning we are gathered to remember and to pay tribute to those who died in that infamous attack 73 years ago today and to recognize the sacrifices made by those brave men and women who survived. And will the guests please rise for the arrival of the official party. And the official party for today's ceremony includes Mr. Paul Dupre, Superintendent, World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument, National Park Service. Rear Admiral, if you can, sir. Rear Admiral Rick Williams, Commander, Navy Region Hawaii and Naval Service Group Middle Pacific. Admiral Harry B. Harris, Commander, U.S. Pacific Fleet. General Lori J. Robinson, Commander, Pacific Air Forces. And Brigadier General Robert M. Hardaway III, U.S. Army retired, and a Pearl Harbor survivor. Please be seated. Thank you. In the Hawaiian culture, the religious leader or spiritual advisor is known as Kahu. Today, we are pleased to have for our invocation a Hawaiian blessing offered by Kahu Kaula Clark.
Aloha kākahi aka kāko. Good morning to all of us. Uh, today I am very honored to do the invocation and aloha chant. And part of this is to honor Ka'a Pahau, who is the shark guardi guardian of Pearl Harbor, who is also my family, Aumakua. Um, this is a sacred place and it's a sacred day and it's made sacred by the lives that were sacrificed here for our benefit as Americans. Um, if all of you will stand as much as possible, um, this chant, I have you stand because you are the connection between heaven and earth, and your behaviors really bring heaven to earth, and those behaviors we appreciate and call the aloha spirit where all are welcome and all come together in brotherhood and sisterhood so with that i'll do the aloha chat Creator of all things, we thank you for this wonderful day here in Hawaii. And we ask that your spirit be with us in all that we do. We ask that that spirit be the spirit of aloha as we share together. And as we share together, we serve as an example to the world as to how we can get along with each other without debate, without argument, without fighting. Uh, may we rest in the knowledge that we are cared for by you. And may we also honor and respect you in all that you have provided for us so that we may live a life here in Hawaii. Uh, we ask that you would be with the survivors so that as we pikai them, we ask for long life and good health. Um, I should say we ask for longer life because most of these people are, have lived long, honorable lives and we appreciate what they have done for us. And may we, the, the younger generations, always remember the sacrifice that they have made for us as a country. Mahalo nui loa, amama ua noa, amama ua noa, amama ua noa. Mahalo. Pikai ceremony is a blessing ceremony. The implements that are used is fresh water for life, pa'akai or sea salt for health. So we ask for long life and good health. Um, the pikai is simply to symbolize the rain that is given. Because of the rains that we have in Hawaii, it nurtures us so that we have all of this greenery and full life. And for that, we are helpful. And I want to thank Brent, my assistant, for doing the Pikai ceremony. Please be seated. <clears throat> Reverend Clark, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's customary on December 7th that we observe a moment of silence at 7.55, which will be in about 30 seconds, to commemorate the beginning of the attacks on Pearl Harbor. At that time, you will hear the USS Chung Hoon sound her ship's whistle. So please join me at that time in bowing our heads from a moment of silence to remember those who courageously fought and those who died here on December 7th. And completing that moment of silence will be F-22 Raptors from the 199th and 19th Fighter Squadrons, known as the Hawaiian Raptors, executing a flyover in honor of those who gave their lives in the defense of their country here 73 years ago.
please rise for our morning colors and the singing of our national anthem and our state song by the Kapolei High School Choir. Bugler, sound attention. Color Guard, parade the colors. Our national anthem, hand salute. Two. Please remain standing for the singing of Hawaii State Song, Hawaii Pono'i, again by Kapolei High School.
Most of the colors, everyone please be seated. How about a hand for the Kapolei High School Choir? <clears throat> Thank you. Great job. It is customary for ships passing the Arizona to pay their respects by rendering honors and approaching over in this direction right here, there it comes, you will see the guided missile destroyer USS Chung Hoon, commanded by Commander Ryan Collins, who is from Longville, Washington. USS Chung Hoon is the 43rd ship of the Arleigh Burke class of guided missile destroyers, and she was christened in 2003 by Punana Chung Hoon, a niece of Rear Admiral Chung Hoon, who is here with us today. Where's the Admiral? Thank you. <clears throat> and today, in addition to rendering honors to Arizona, USS Chung Hoon will also render honors to the Pearl Harbor survivors, <clears throat> excuse me, who have gathered with us today. In December of 1941, Robert M. Hardaway III was stationed at the North Sector General Hospital in Schofield Barracks on the morning of the attack. He was the first physician to arrive at the hospital and began treatment on the casualties that were already pouring in. Today, General Hardaway is ready to return honors as a representative for all Pearl Harbor survivors. Assisting General Hardaway is Petty Officer First Class Gregory Quinn. Robert Hardaway was born at Camp John Hay in the Philippines, actually, in January 1916. He received an A.B. from the University of Denver in 1936, and M.D. cum laude from Washington University, St. Louis, in 1939. He entered the Army as a first lieutenant, U.S. Army Medical Corps, on July 1, 1940, at Fitzsimmons General Hospital in Denver, and he retired from the U.S. Army in 1975 as a Brigadier General and went on to become professor of surgery at the Texas School of Medicine in El Paso. All Pearl Harbor survivors are invited to stand as able. General Hardaway will return the salute to the USS Chung Hoon. And salute. Ready to? <clears throat> and carry on. Will all survivors please be seated? And would certainly like to thank the USS Chung Hoon and the 199th and 19th Fighter Squadrons for participating in today's ceremony. And General Hardaway, thank you so much for your participation. <clears throat> Thank you. 
For the past 33 years, the Japan Religious Committee for World Federation has offered a prayer for peace on this occasion, and we are honored to have them once again as part of this ceremony. Reverend Shitoshi Noshita will offer the prayer followed by the English translation given by Ms. Mihoko Mayer.世界連邦日本宗教委員会第33回パールハーバー平和記念施設団平和の祈り私たち世界連邦日本宗教 委員会は73年前の今日ここで全てを捧げられた方と御霊を追悼し平和を祈るためのこの神聖な式典に出席させていただくのは今回で33回目となりました This gathering marks the 33rd year that we, the Japan Religious Committee for World Federation, have been part of this hallowed ceremony to pray for peace and the sacred memory of those that gave their all. 73 years ago. これは長い時間です。それでも私たちの記憶にしっかりと刻まれています。本日ここにご臨席の皆様とともに御霊たちを忍び、そして。歴史から学んだ多くの教訓を心に深く刻み心豊かで平和な世界を築くため決意を新たにするとともに戦没者及び戦争による犠牲者に対し慎んで祈りを捧げます Seventy-three years, that's a long time, but still we remember. Together we remember the heroic souls and historic events that still stir our hearts and still our resolve to learn from the past, to renew our commitment to peace and understanding and reverence for those we honor today. そこくをそして家族を守るためにその明るい未来を失った若者たちその教訓を次の世代に伝え続けるため私たちは今年もここに集います Once again, lessons learned are memorialized at this sacred place and time to honor loved ones that gave their last breath for the, their countries. ]戦争が終わりこのような式典が 毎年開催され毎年この場所に
追悼のために集う人々は尊い犠牲を決して忘れることなく友愛の精神を持って人類の平和と相互理解そして未来に大きな希望を抱きながらこの地を後にするものです。The peaceful ending to that conflict is cause for celebration, and we are full of hope that, in the spirit of friendship, we again leave this hallowed place with resolved honor those brave souls through peace and understanding. Inorimashou. The world is really peaceful and all the people are happy to be here. This Earth is a place of one place to live and live to live and live to 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 live to live. 神仏の限りない未明組のもと真の世界平和実現のためお役に立たせてください。Let the world become bright and happy. Let our prayers provide peace for the living and for those that we will join one day. Thank you. 33回世界連邦日本宗教委員会ハワイ平和記念施設団団長の下千歳。The Japan Religious Committee for World Federation, the 33rd Peace Prayers, the leader, Shitoshi Noshita. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Today's Pearl Harbor Day commemoration, <clears throat> excuse me, is co-hosted, as it has been for many years, by the National Park Service and the United States Navy. Here to share an official welcome is Paul Dupre, Superintendent of World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument. He'll be followed by Rear Admiral Rick Williams, Commander of Navy Region Hawaii and Naval Service Group Middle Pacific. Paul Dupre and Admiral Matt Williams. Well, aloha. It is uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to the Pearl Harbor Visitor Center for this 73rd anniversary commemoration. And uh, if I may say so, we've got quite a crowd this morning, so this is great. This year's commemoration asks the question about how to keep the story of the attack on Oahu and World War II alive for the nation and for the world. We all share in this responsibility of being stewards for our nation's history, even as it passes before our eyes. Museums and historic sites play key roles in preserving artifacts, in letters, the diaries, the photographs. We interview and record accounts of eyewitnesses and survivors so we can understand their actions. And so that, uh, so that it's through that understanding that a heightened level of respect for those who endured World War II and its brutal nature can arrive. It's through this understanding that we can educate the over 30,000 students who come through Pearl Harbor every year. The recent placement of the Shrine Room Wall on the USS Arizona Memorial is a further example of preserving that memory of those lost on December 7, 1941. And through our close partnerships with Pacific Historic Parks AMVETS, the U.S. Navy, and hundreds of others. A treasured icon 
for Pearl Harbor, for Hawaii, and for our nation will continue to inspire the millions of visitors who come every year. Among the dignitaries I'd like to welcome this morning are the Honorable David Ige, Governor for the State of Hawaii. General Lori J. Robinson, Commander, Pacific Air Forces. The Honorable Jan Brewer, Governor, State of Arizona. Admiral Harry B. Harris, Commander, U.S. Pacific Fleet. The Honorable Brian Schatz, U.S. Senator. The Honorable K. Mark Takai, U.S. Representative, elect. Admiral Ron Hayes, Admiral Richard Mackey, Lieutenant General John Tulin, the Honorable Kirk Caldwell, Mayor of the City and County of Honolulu, the Honorable Tamio Mori, Mayor of Nagaoka, Japan, members of the Consular Corps, members of the Senior Executive Service, and all other flag and general officers, elected and appointed officials, business and community leaders. I also want to just thank all of the hundreds of volunteers from the many dozens of organizations at the state, local, and federal level who are, and you know, they're just doing a fantastic job helping make this event take place. And I'm especially happy to welcome the many Pearl Harbor survivors, Pacific War veterans, and their family members and friends. Thank you for recognizing the need to remember Pearl Harbor. Mahalo Nui Loa to all of you for your long years of service as caretakers of this important mission. Thank you. Adam Williams. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Distinguished veterans and guests, ladies and gentlemen, aloha. aloha. And welcome to this special commemoration ceremony. Our theme today is preserving the memory a commitment that future generations will always remember the service and sacrifice the members of the greatest generation made on December 7th, 1941, and in the war that followed. It is an honor to welcome back our Pearl Harbor survivors as we share in this remembrance for their fallen comrades. We also welcome back the many family members who are equally dedicated to preserving the memory. We also want to thank our partners at the National Park Service, our American veterans, our memorials, our museums, and our AMVETs that have also been a big part of today and this week's uh, activities. You know, Tom Brokaw named this generation the greatest, and that was for good reason. Those we lost on the day of infamy served American ideals of freedom, justice, and equality for all. Those ideals were taken across the Pacific. They live on today where our former adversaries are now close friends and allies. Pearl Harbor survivors helped unite all Americans, and as a result of their efforts and the sacrifice of their shipmates, we achieved greater equality, greater civil rights, and greater prosperity, with more freedom and democracy for others. Today's ceremony shows the world the importance of our survivors and how they never forgot the friends and the brothers and the sisters they lost or the common cause for which they fought. We are dedicated to always remember Pearl Harbor and to preserving the memory for future generations. And now, we are very fortunate to have Admiral Harry Harris as our guest speaker today. Admiral Harris has served in every geographic combatant command region. He has led major operations worldwide, including operations Desert Steel Shield, Desert Storm, Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, and Odyssey Dawn in Libya. Admiral Harris is one in a line of U.S. Navy officers who have served as the consummate statesman and diplomat here in Hawaii and around the world, as well as the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Today, he walks in the footsteps of Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz as the U.S. Pacific Fleet Commander, and he has been nominated by the President, President Obama, to be the next commander of the U.S. Pacific Command. 
Now and in the future, Admiral Harris is preserving the memory and your legacy as he leads America's rebalance to the Indo-Asia Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, the Commander, United States Pacific Fleet, Admiral Harry B. Harris. Thanks, Rick, for that great introduction and for your leadership as a region commander. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up again for the Capital A High School Chorus. There's no better way to preserve the memory than have young men and women uh, participate in events like this. So as I look around today, I realize there are so many distinguished guests here that it would take a whole hour for me to name them all, so I won't. Um, but I do want to acknowledge a few. Uh, Governors Brewer and Ige, we're very glad you're here today. Uh, Governor Brewer from Arizona, the Grand Canyon State. We have our own Grand Canyon here in Hawaii and hope you have the chance to visit that. And uh, Governor uh, Ige has been in office for six days and this is probably his 12th official event. So thanks, Governor, for being here. Senator Schatz, Representative-elect Takai, Mayor Caldwell, State and, and uh, City Leaders, esteemed members of our consular and diplomatic corps, CNO Admiral Hayward, Admirals Hayes, Mackey, Kahune, fellow flag and general officers, Mr. Dupre, veterans past and present. And most of all, a special welcome uh, to the greatest generation of World War II veterans and Pearl Harbor survivors to whom we owe an immeasurable debt of gratitude for their heroic efforts seven decades ago. So for the last 73 years here in the Pacific, we've remembered Pearl Harbor, we've remained vigilant, and just as the greatest generation before us, today's armed forces are more than ready to answer the alarm, and if need be, we're ready to fight tonight and win. And we're doing everything we can to keep the, those alarm bells from sounding in the first place by enacting America's current strategic rebalance to the Indo-Asia Pacific, designed to maintain stability, prosperity, and peace throughout the region. And a key leader in that rebalance strategy is today's guest speaker. And because she's going to do most of the talking today, my part in this ceremony is pretty easy. All I have to do is introduce her. But the challenge for me is to convey to you the nature of who she is without taking the easy way out and simply reading her bio. You can read her bio, too. It's in the program, and I encourage you to do so. But wait until after she's spoken, or you'll miss some important learning. So about 100 years ago, there was this chess player by the name of Frank Marshall. Most of you probably don't know Frank, but for 27 years, he held the title of United States chess champion. During that time, he captained the US team to four gold medals at the Chess Olympiads. Chess was a big deal back then. He was considered the greatest and the strongest chess player in the world. Now, I see some confused looks out there. I know you all are wondering where I'm going with this, so just bear with me for a moment. Now, Frank was respected for his brilliant strategic and tactical skills, and he made chess history in 1912 when he was playing against the reigning Russian chess champion. Toward the end of that game, he sacrificed his queen, allowing it to be captured any number of ways. That unexpected move allowed him to win the game just a few minutes later, just a few moves later. And to this day, it's considered one of the most brilliant chess moves ever. Legend says that the audience was so delighted by his victory that they showered the game board with gold coins. Now, what is Frank Marshall's legendary master of chess have to do with our guest speaker? Well, I'm going to tell you. General Lori Robinson served as an ABM, an air battle manager, the essence of which is command and control. With a powerful radar of AWACS aircraft, she held the God's view of the entire game board, including the disposition of friendly and enemy aircraft, determining the best tactics, and then directing the movement of forces to ensure that the good guys are always able to checkmate the bad guys. As far as ABMers go, she's the best of the best. She went on to serve as an ABM instructor, teaching at the weapons school and then later at her squadron as the chief of tactics. 
In chess terms, ladies and gentlemen, General Lori Robinson is an air battle manager grandmaster. She's an accomplished leader, having led airmen as she commanded an operations group, a training wing, and an air control wing. During operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom, she deployed as the vice commander of the 405th Air Expeditionary Wing, where she, required, where she was required to continuously assess the tactical situation on both sides of the battlefield and to marshal forces to put bombs on target on time, surprising enemy forces, and leading the U.S. team to victory each time. And she has spent a sizable amount of time studying leadership and strategy, all that stuff that goes into winning on the battlefield. She's earned one master's degree from Troy State University and another from the Naval War College. Let me repeat that, the Naval War College. And she's a fellow of the Brookings Institution and Harvard University. So clearly she's got the intellect to back up her operational savvy. Just as Frank Marshall was showered with gold coins for his ability to win at the game of chess, Lori has been recognized for her bold leadership in the profession of arms. She's made history as the first ABMer to put on four stars. And now she's the commander of the Pacific Air Forces, responsible for all Air Force activities encompassing over half the globe. I always say that 70% of the world is covered by water. Well, the last time I checked, 100% of the world is covered by air. And her being PACAF, And her being PACAF is another first for an air battle manager. No doubt the Air Force recognizes her mastery of her craft and all she has to offer a leading and important part of the combat air forces. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to introduce to you our guest speaker today, General Lori Robinson. Wow, uh, what better introduction can you get from your, if confirmed, new boss? It doesn't get any better than that. Thanks, boss, I appreciate that. Uh, for those of you that don't know, first I wanna say aloha, and what an amazing day. I can only imagine that this is what this day looked like all those years ago. Do I have it about right? Yeah, I mean, it's just phenomenal. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Admiral Harris's father and four of his uncles fought in World War II. Uh, in fact, his father was at Pearl Harbor in 1941 aboard uh, aircraft carrier USS Lexington. And when it set sail just two days before the attack, boss, or soon to be if confirmed boss, uh, thank you to you and your family uh, for your service and your sacrifice. I can only imagine the stories around the dinner table uh, that has ensured that you and yours preserve the memories. Survivors, families, of the attack on Oahu, Governor Ige, Mrs. Ige, Governor Brewer, Senator Schatz, Congressman-elect Takai, Mayor Caldwell, Mayor Mori, fellow general and flag officers, distinguished visitors, veterans, past and present, ladies and gentlemen, I don't even know how to begin to say thank you for coming here today. Thank you uh, for commemorating this infamous day in our nation's history on this Sunday I can't tell you how privileged I feel and deeply honored to be with you as we pay tribute to more than 2,400 soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, and civilians who made the ultimate sacrifice. The events of December 7, 1941 served as a turning point in our nation's history. Although the attacks occurred so suddenly, so unexpectedly, and in such tragic proportions, our reluctant nation emerged to fight and ultimately win World War II. For me, it is so difficult to imagine the events of that Sunday morning 73 years ago. Even as it was a day of sacrifice and of loss, it was a day of gallantry and unquestionable heroism. Countless brave Americans, like many of those who are here in the front row today, not only rallied the response to the attacks, but fought intrepidly in many years of war that followed. Today, we are joined by many survivors, to include four of the nine living USS Arizona survivors, Don Stratton, Lauren Bruner, Lou Conter, 
and John Anderson. Thank you for your service and sacrifice, and thank you for honoring us with your presence today. You know, this afternoon, they are holding a service aboard the USS Arizona Memorial. They will toast their fallen shipmates and other survivors who are unable to attend today with a glass of sparkling wine given to their association by President Ford in 1975. After they toast, they will hand one of the glasses to a team of Navy and National Park Service divers who will place it at the base of the Arizona Guns Turret 4. Through these memorial services, new memories are created and memories are preserved, as remaining glasses will become artifacts maintained by the National Park Service. Gun Turret 4 is significant also because it's the final resting spot for survivors of the attack who wish to have their ashes placed at their formal battle station. And so, since 1980, 38 Arizona survivors have been reunited with their brothers on the ship. The stories of these survivors are nothing short of amazing. After the ammunition magazine exploded on the Arizona and engulfed the entire forward half of the ship, both Don and Lauren escaped the inferno with the help of a sailor named Joe George. From the deck of the repair vessel, which was moored alongside the Arizona, Joe threw him a line. They pulled the line across and tied it to the sky control platform. Despite severe burns, over 60% of their bodies, they negotiated the line hand over hand some 45 feet in the air. In total, six men made it across the line. Incredibly, despite their injuries, both Don and Lauren returned to military service and fought in multiple major campaigns across the Pacific. Like these men, Lou also returned to service in the Navy. He attended flight training and later deployed in the South Pacific as an early black cat pilot. In the fall of 1943, he received a battlefield commission. Around the same time, his crew was shot down, not once, but twice. He later served as one of the first survival, evasion, resistance, and escape officers in the Navy. Now, John Anderson served on board the Arizona with his twin brother, Delbert. After the enormous explosion, he saved several shipmates, carrying them to safety before loading them onto small boats. He was ordered off the ship by his superior, but refused to go because he did not want to leave his brother behind. Eventually, he was forcibly shoved onto a small boat, which took him to Fort Island. Spotting an empty boat from shore, John and another sailor commandeered it and returned back to the Arizona. He went on to rescue three additional shipmates, but never found his brother. On his return to Fort Island, their small boat was rocked by an explosion, leaving John as the only survivor. When the Arizona sank, she took with her 1,177 sailors and Marines. Many families paid an enormous price as a result of the attack. Among those who perished were 30 sets of brothers, to include three families who lost all three of their sons. These men fought together as brothers in arms, and now, they rest side by side in their watery grave. Although they gave their last full measure of devotion to our nation, their fact, sacrifice will never be forgotten. The heroic resolve displayed during these attacks was not just limited to our uh, military. At Hickam Field, we owe many thanks to the Honolulu Fire Department. After receiving the alarm at 0805 in the morning, engine companies won four, and six were dispatched to res respond. Without knowing it, the Honolulu Fire Department was going to war. Three firefighters would never return, and six others were seriously injured. That fateful morning, they reported to Hickam Fire Station expecting to simply assist with firefighting efforts. What they found instead was a fire station, along with a quarter mile long row of airplanes and hangars fully engulfed in flames. Only a single fire engine made it out of the station. But after the driver was strafed and killed, the engine laid dead in its tracks 20 feet onto the ramp. These men soon realized they were, only, they were the only firefighting force available to put out fires, to rescue survivors, and to receive bodies. 
Hickam Field's primary water main was destroyed by a bomb, which was severely hampered their firefighting efforts. The bomb created an enormous crater that rapidly filled with water. Since none of the hydrants work, the men were attempting to suction water from the crater when they were hit by a second wave of attacks. The men who survived quickly turned to care for the injured and to repair their equipment and trucks. Using brown soap and toilet paper, they plugged holes in their pumper trucks and returned to firefighting. In total, they laid over 6,400 feet of two and a half inch line by hand. Fires of this magnitude burning at Hickam Field would normally have been fought with large nozzles, discharging 1,500 to 2,000 gallons of water per minute. On this day, it was only 60 to 90 gallons per minute were available. Once Hickam's water system was restored that afternoon, they gained momentum and the fires were quelled without further incident. They fought aircraft and hangar fires, fuel storage blazes and burning ammunition buildings, cramming a lifetime of firefighting experiences into one day. For their courage and heroism, nine of these firefighters received Purple Hearts, a commendation traditionally reserved for military personnel wounded in combat. The tremendous contributions of our first responders cannot be overstated. As we've seen, Brigadier General Retired Robert Hardaway is here, and he's joined us. After the Japanese dive bombers descended on Wheeler Field and Schofield Barracks, Dr. Hardaway, the first physician to arrive at the hospital, treated some of the first casualties of the attack. Later that night, when a total blackout was ordered, he performed life-saving surgery under a blanket with flashlights. Battling exhaustion and the uncertainty of his wife's whereabouts, he worked 48 hours straight to care for over 100 wounded soldiers. Fortunately, his wife, Lee, was evacuated to safety in Honolulu on the night of the 7th. And while many women and children left Hawaii and stayed on the mainland after the attacks, Lee joined the Women's Air Raid Defense Organization at Fort Shafter. In March of 1942, the Japanese attempted a smaller and lesser known air raid against Oahu. Lee and the Women's Air Raid Defense tracked these incoming Japanese airplanes and scrambled the island's defense forces. Fortunately, due to cloud cover, the attack planes could not find their target and minimal damage was inflicted. The attacks of December 7, 1941 were no doubt terrifying, and unfortunately, the children of Ford Island had a front row seat. We have six of the children from Battleship Row in attendance today. Sincerely, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Ms. Patricia Bellinger Kaufman is the daughter of Rear Admiral Bellinger, who commanded Navy Patrol Wing 2. Their home, known as Quarter K, sheltered the wives and children of Battleship Row during the attack. The children of Ford Island uh, referred to its basement as a dungeon because the thick, heavy cement design was originally intended for ammunition storage. Through the basement turret openings, they watched as destroyers and battleships burst into flames and witnessed the horror of men being plunged into the blazing, oil-burning waters. They also watched as Japanese pilots strafed men attempting to crawl to the safety of their basement. As a child, Patricia assisted her mother with caring for the wounded, providing blankets and what little aid she could. They spent the next two nights in the basement, bracing for the air raids of, or a possible invasion. There were no bathrooms. And for drinking, they boiled the chlorinated water they recovered from the swimming pool down the road. These women and children sat huddled around a radio when President Roosevelt announced our nation's formal declaration of war. After the radio address, they listened to our national anthem. And to this day, it gives me chills to think about what that moment must have felt like. It is critical that our nation preserve the memories of these events, not only to honor those who sacrificed so much, but to capture the stories and the lessons learned. The letters, the diaries, the photographs, and the interviews from that time are national treasure. And they are used to educate, commemorate, and memorialize this greatest nation and this greatest generation and the sacrifices they made. By honoring our past, we inspire our future and assure the events of this day, 73 years ago, are not forgotten. 
Pacific Airmen are reminded of this event, of the events on December 7, 1941, as they walk into work at Pacific Air Force's headquarters building every single day. Because you see, in 1941, the headquarters building was a 3,000-man barracks, making it a major target for the, uh, for the attack. Among other damage, a 500-pound bomb was dropped in the center of the building, instantly killing 35 men. Today, the wall still bears shrapnel and bullet holes, and when airmen walk past these battle-scarred walls, they are reminded of the perseverance, courage, and valor of our Pacific airmen. The headquarters preserves the memory with a memorial called the Courtyard of Heroes. It sits in a, in courtyard, it sits in a display case uh, that houses the flag which flew over Hickam Field during the attack. After a failed bombing attempt of the flag, Japanese Zeros attempted to cut the flag off at the flagpole with a heavy stream of bullets. Although torn and tattered, Old Glory continued to wave in the midst of all the destruction. Following the attack, the flag was lowered and placed for safekeeping. Soon after, it was shipped to General Hap Arnold, Chief of Army Air Forces in Washington, D.C. For the next five years, the flag was showcased in bond rallies throughout the United States raising support for the war effort. Now, as it did then, it symbolizes the unbreakable American spirit. Today, the flag is encased in a Cowood display. Cowood, most of you know, is native to the islands, and Co is also a word known as warrior. The flag became a warrior in its own right that day, December 7th, 1941, and it is fitting to encase it in the wood of the warrior. As our nation rebalances to the Asia-Pacific region, I can assure you the current generation of American warriors stands ready. So may God bless you, all of our military, civil service men and women, both past and present, who have bravely answered our nation's call time and time again, and who will never fail us. Mahalo. General Robinson, Admiral Harris, thank you so much for your very, very inspiring remarks. We'll always remember those, and Godspeed to both of you. Today we honor heroes, military and civilians who lost their lives on December 7th, 1941. Wreaths represent an expression of our gratitude and a symbol of our unending appreciation for their service and sacrifice. And this morning, we will place a wreath in honor of the State of Hawaii, U.S. Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force and Air Corps, and the Coast Guard. Presenting the wreaths will be Pearl Harbor survivors accompanied by children from the Navy Holly Keiki School's Young Patriots Club, National Park Service staff, and personnel from our U.S. Armed Services. This formation represents our past, present, and future it honors those who fought in the name of freedom 72, 73 years ago and recognizes our current armed forces who continue to serve our country selflessly. These wreaths also represent hope that our future generations may never, never forget the many sacrifices that took place and continue to take place every day. The bell you will hear is from the USS Arizona. Now, the state of Hawaii. Forty-nine civilians lost their lives on December 7th. The people of Hawaii made great contributions to the war effort in the Pacific. And as a base for all of the services, the territory of Hawaii and her citizens played a major role in what became known as the greatest salvage and repair effort ever known by quickly restoring the majority of the damaged ships and expediting their return to the fleet. Her citizens opened their homes and businesses to servicemen stationed in Hawaii and to those returning from war patrols. Today, the state of Hawaii remains a strategic home port for all five services and because of her location and her people. Representing the state of Hawaii, our National Park Service Ranger Joe Borgia, second grader Eli Lamoth, Sergeant Brian Truckee, 
and Pearl Harbor witness Patricia Bellinger Kaufman. As mentioned by General Robinson, Patricia Bellinger Kaufman is the daughter of Admiral Patrick Bellinger, who was in command of Patrol Wing 2 of the Naval Air of the Pacific. And on the day of the attack, as mentioned, she and several other children were playing in their family house right over there on Fort Island. And when the call came at 7.30, they were all herded downstairs into the bomb shelter, and she was put in charge of evacuees from the bombed ships. Patricia recalls the heroism of her mother, who was recovering supplies from their house, despite the danger of planes strafing the area and flying shrap shrapnel. Will our civilian survivors and witnesses please stand as able? Civilian survivors and witnesses, please be seated. United States Army. <laughs> Representing the United States Army and the 233 Army and Air Corps personnel who lost their lives that day, our National Park Service Ranger Scott Pulowski, Second Grader Oscar McKay, Sergeant Mark Geok, and Pearl Harbor survivor Dale Robinson. Dale on that day was a 19-year-old corporal enjoying the beautiful Hawaiian air that morning. And as he was walking around Schofield Barracks, he heard a plane flying very low. And as it flew over him, he saw the pilot clear as day. The plane didn't shoot at him, so he assumed he was scouting when all of a sudden he heard bombs falling at nearby Wheeler Field and as far away right here at Pearl Harbor. It took his unit a long time to get ammunition, and by that time they missed all of that action. However, in 1944, he landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day Plus 3 and followed the German army into France, Belgium, and Germany until the surrender. So, will our army survivors and army veterans please stand as able? survivors and veterans, please be seated. United States Marine Corps. Many may not realize until visiting the USS Arizona Memorial that Marines were embarked as part of the battleship's company. Of the 109 Marines who lost their lives that day, 105 were embarked in ships within the harbor. Representing the 109 Marines who lost their lives on December 7th, our National Park Service Ranger Lynn Neufeld, Second Grader Addison Cornelius, Corporal William Deerfield, and Pearl Harbor survivor Don Ollum. Don was born in South St. Paul, Minnesota, and currently resides in Osakis, Minnesota. I'm sure he's happy to be here today. He enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1940 at the age of 16, and after boot camp and sea school, he was assigned to the USS Oklahoma. And on December 7th, he was standing on the fantail of the ship, waiting to present arms at the raising of the colors when the attack started. After the attack, he was reassigned to the South Pacific, which took him to the islands of New Caledonia, 
Bougainville, Guadalcanal, Vela La Vela, Iwo Jima, and Saipan. And he left the Marines at the age of 22 and the rank of sergeant. So will our Marine Corps survivors and Marine veterans please stand as able. Corps survivors and veterans, the very active ones, please be seated. <laughs> United States Navy. <laughs> Representing the United States Navy and the 1,999 sailors who lost their lives during the attack on Pearl Harbor and Kaneohe Naval Air Station, our National Park Service Ranger Alfred Strapp, second grader Reed Klug, Seaman Thomas Lobach, and Pearl Harbor survivor John Chapman. John was stationed aboard the USS West Virginia. He was standing below deck when a torpedo struck the ship. When the executive officer gave the order to not give up the ship, John managed to swim down, open the valves to counter flood the hulls, and escape with a group of men. He spent the rest of the morning rescuing comrades from the burning, oil-covered water. And throughout the afternoon and into the next morning, John worked on rescuing men out of the overturned USS Oklahoma. After the war, he became a Navy diver and was again stationed at Pearl Harbor, where he helped build the USS Arizona Memorial. So will our Navy survivors and Navy veterans please join John, stand as able. Navy survivors and veterans, please be seated. United States Air Force. Though not yet a service in 1941, the United States Air Force was formally referred to as our Army Air Corps. This branch is built upon the spirit like that of Lieutenants Ken Taylor and George Welsh, who in spite of the danger found operational aircraft and braved the skies against incredible odds. Bombing and strafing attacks that morning by carrier-based planes of the Japanese strike force destroyed many assigned aircraft and caused heavy casualties. However, 12 of the group's pilots succeeded in launching their P-36 and P-40 aircraft from Wheeler and Holly Eva fields, flew a total of 16 sorties, and destroyed 10 enemy planes. Welsh and Taylor, P-40 pilots assigned to the 47th Pursuit Squadron shot down four and two respectively and were later cited for extraordinary heroism during the attack. Both received the Distinguished Service Cross. Representing the United States Air Force or National Park Service Ranger Stephen Cam Cam, First Grader Isaac Canfield, Staff Sergeant Erica Wagner, and Pearl Harbor survivor John Matrus. Seaman Second Class John was stationed on Fort Island on December 7th at just 18 years old. He was awaiting orders from the USS Enterprise due in a few days later. And when the attack began, he was near the USS California along Battleship Row and helped rescue men out of the water and bring them safely to the barracks. He managed to obtain a rifle and began shooting at the planes overhead. So will our Air Corps and Air Force survivors and Air Force veterans please stand as able.
Thank you. Air Corps and Air Force survivors, Air Force veterans, please be seated. United States Coast Guard. At the time of the attack, vessels of the U.S. Coast Guard, USS, U.S. Coast Guard, I'm sorry, in service in Hawaii were all stationed in Honolulu. At 6.45 a.m., the patrol craft Tiger intercepted a dispatch from the USS Ward that claimed destruction of a submarine. This was off of, out in front of the harbor here. Later, Tiger herself came under enemy fire, but fortunately did not suffer any casualties. Representing the United States Coast Guard as National Park Service Ranger Carrie Getz, First Grader Audrey Leong, Petty Officer Kelvin Andrews, and Pearl Harbor survivor Louis Contour. Lou Contour was standing watch on the stern end of the ship when he saw the Japanese planes diving at his ship. And within seconds, the Arizona's crew began to fire back. A few minutes later, there was a great explosion in the bow of the ship, lifted about 30 feet out of the water, and it erupted into an inferno. It took less than nine minutes to take USS Arizona and 1,777 of her sailors and Marines to the bottom of Pearl Harbor. Lou spent the next hour fighting fires and helping pull seriously burned men to safety. Eventually, he was evacuated to Fort Island by a small launch. Will our Coast Guard survivors and Coast Guard veterans please stand as able? Coast Guard survivors and veterans, please be seated. Now, we want to thank so much the wreath presenters. Thank you all, everybody, for your action this morning. We really appreciate it, especially the survivors who made it out there. Thank you. And now, would all Pearl Harbor survivors please stand as able. Gentlemen, thank you. We certainly want to express our appreciation to these heroes who bravely stood at their posts and by their shipmates and superbly executed their duties during the worst attack our nation had yet seen. And would all family members of the survivors please stand and be recognized. And civilian witnesses of the attack, please stand and be recognized. Those of you who were there. And would all, would all other veterans, U.S. and foreign, and merchant mariners, please stand as able and be recognized. Come on, we know there are a lot of you back there, so stand up. It is because of you and others like you that we enjoy the freedom and the liberty that we have today. During the Walk of Honor, which will take place a little bit later, there will be a 1944 North American SNJ 5B vintage aircraft flown by Bruce Mays of the Pacific Warbirds in honor of those who gave their lives in the defense of their country here 73 years ago today. This SNJ, and I'm sure many of you remember it, is also known as the T-6 Texan. 
It has a paint scheme from the USS Saratoga, CV-3, which was based in Pearl Harbor in 1941, but was in San Diego during the September, December 7th attack. So please be seated. Thank you again so much. <laughs> That'll come by in a little bit. <clears throat> Many organizations have donated wreaths today and are listed in your program. And these wreaths have been placed on board the USS Arizona Memorial. A boat will depart at 1100 hours this morning for the donors of those wreaths. And we would like to invite all of you to attend the USS Oklahoma Memorial Wreath Laying Ceremony on Ford Island, if you can, today at 1.30. And attendees may ride the shuttle bus at the USS Bofin, and the Bofin, by the way, is a submarine right over there to your right, uh, at no charge. So please alert the bus attendant that you're attending the USS Arizona Memorial Ceremony. Shuttles will depart every 15 minutes. And those with military base access may drive on to Fort Island to the memorial. Immediately after our ceremony, we would like to recognize our honored guests and all Pearl Harbor survivors, World War II veterans, and civilian December witnesses who are able to exit through the, through the walk of honor. So please rise and remain standing for the benediction, a cannon salute by the 3rd Battalion, 7th Field Artillery, based at Schofield Barracks, and echo taps by the Pacific Fleet Band. Captain Kennedy, Navy Region Hawaii, and Naval Service Group Middle Pacific will now offer the benediction. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we conclude our ceremony, we give thanks for your many blessings and entrust the souls of those who died on December 7, 1941, and those who have died in the ensuing years to your loving care. We ask that you watch over those who survived the attack and the families of those who have died. Console them in their times of grief. We are humbled by the scope of the loss that day and by the bravery, courage, and heroism shown by so many members of the military and the local community. They are examples which inspire the men and women of today. May all people remember what happened here, and may we commit ourselves to work tirelessly for peace and stability throughout the world. Finally, we ask that you watch over, protect, and grant safe passage to all those deployed away from their families and loved ones. Amen.
Ready to. <clears throat> we can remain standing now for the departure of the official party and our honored guest, and may we have all Pearl Harbor survivors, World War II veterans, and civilian December witnesses who are able, with their families and guests, please exit through the Walk of Honor. We certainly want to thank everybody here this morning. And I, just a little personal note, there was a great story in the newspaper yesterday about the four survivors who managed to find their way to Hotel Street and Smith's Bar. And how about that? <laughs> Very significant part of this whole thing. We want to thank them. The tour program will run from 11 to 1.30 today. For tickets, please visit the ticket counter. On behalf of everybody, the Park Service, thank you for attending. And for our online broadcast, we also extend a sincere aloha. And enjoy the music from the band. Thank you, everybody. See you all next year. Job well done. Oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I'm sorry?